Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This will be the 10th lecture in our wood design series. Today's music comes from the album Raising Frequency by the artist Ketza. A link is included in the video description. Uh, this video is going to be uh, all about types of solid sawn lumber, uh, how they are classified, the difference between nominal and actual dimensions, and other related topics related to lumber design. Today we are going to learn a whole bunch of wood terminology and definitions, and we will then be using those definitions as we move further along in the course. First, let's talk about the larger universe of wood design products. As this is a structural engineering discussion, I'm going to ignore non-structural wood products. Uh, while paper, cardboard, wood insulation, and wood shingles are interesting in their own right, they aren't relevant to our discussion here. Broadly speaking, there are two broad high-level categories of structural wood products. First, uh, let's look at the general classification of wood products, or lumber products. So, we're going to classify them. There are two broad categories of lumber products. We have sawn lumber, and we have engineered wood products, which I'll just call engineered uh, wood. I'll just call engineered wood for now. Okay, so what do these entail? Well, again, um, generally sawn lumber is anything that you can form by carving directly from a tree. If you can take a, if you can take the trunk of a tree, a large log, whatever, and uh, cut it down and your and carve it into a smaller component, if you can make that pro a certain product via that process without doing anything else, without adding any glue, any fasteners, anything else, that product is called a sawn lumber product. And the uh, general uh, subcategories we have things like oh boards. We have dimensional lumber, and we will go and discuss what these are exactly, or, or we'll specifically define them. Uh, then you have posts and timbers, and beams and stringers. And then there are a whole massive variety, uh, a myriad of various engineered wood products. Um, but you have things like sheet goods. These are things like plywood, OSB, oriented strand, bur oriented strand board, particle board, etc. Uh, then you also have things like uh, glue laminated timber, or glue laminated lumber, so I'll just call that glue lambs. So glue lamb beams, glue lamb columns, that sort of thing. Uh, then you have things like uh, mass laminated products. So mass laminated products. Or mass timber products. And these would be things like CLT, cross laminated timber, and mass plywood panels. Any sort of thing where you're taking large uh, pieces of sawn lumber, like 2x4s, and laminating th them together into a large construction. And that's the general broad category of, uh, of, wood, uh, of wood and lumber products. And in this lecture, we're going to discuss uh, and focus on sawn lumber products. In this video, we are going to focus on sawn lumber. As mentioned, sawn lumber is just that, a lumber product that was sawn directly from a tree. First of all, we should mention how sawn lumber is labeled. It is always labeled by its narrowest dimension first. You have probably heard of a 2x4, but you've probably never heard of or encountered a 4x2. Sawn lumber products are labeled according to the cross section's dimension, i.e. if you have a 2x4 is a 2x4, whether it is 8 feet long or 12 feet long. In other words, here, um, if you have a 2x4, You'll never encounter a 4x2. Um, a 2x4 on its side is still just a 2x4. It doesn't matter um, what direction it's oriented, although the direction of orientation does have certain applications or implications, I should say, in terms of strength, especially in things, especially in terms of things like bending. But in terms of labeling, a cross section has one single label, and for sawn lumber, again, 
it is always going to be labeled by the narrowest dimension first. Second, some number is described according to its nominal, not its actual dimensions. Nominal dimensions are the labeled or sticker dimensions of a cross-section, uh, rather than if you go up to it with a ruler or a set of calipers and actually measure the dimension, the actual dimensions that you would measure are, of course, the actual dimensions, while the labeled or sticker dimensions are the nominal dimension. So uh, why the difference? Well, um, one way to think of this is that nominal dimensions can be thought of as the cross-section's dimensions immediately at the time of sawing. Um, so, uh, immediately after being sawn. We, so we but we typically don't use lumber immediately out of the sawmill. Uh, we do what we do. We do what we uh, refer to as dressing and seasoning it. Again, uh, the nominal dimension of a piece of sawn lumber can be thought of as its dimensions at the time of sawing. So you have a tree and it's you know green lumber. You saw it and you carve a and you uh, saw a two inch by four inch cross section out of this uh, tree trunk. And right at the time of sawing, its dimensions are approximately two inches by four inches. Whatever happens to that board or that piece of lumber afterwards, whatever happens to that two by four, whatever dimensional changes it undergoes, as long as it isn't re-sawn um, enough to change its cross section, uh, as long as its cross section doesn't change by sawing, um, any changes due to um, shrinkage or moisture effects or seasoning, uh, or even finishing, it will still remain a 2 by 4 So, uh, we mentioned lumber is seasoning. Well, what does that mean? Well, seasoning refers to drying the lumber, whether through kiln or air drying. At the time of being cut down, a tree might be, uh, let's say approximately two-thirds or more water. Lumber this moist is undesirable, as it is vulnerable to rot and decay. So, we season or dry it. This causes some reduction in size due to shrinkage from loss of moisture. Dressing lumber is another term you should be aware of. Um, again, lumber seasoning is the process of drying or lowering its moisture content, and dressing is the process of sanding or smoothing lumber after it has been sawn. Or in other words, dressing refers to cleaning up the surface of a piece of lumber. Uh, this is done via planing or sanding. So, uh, construction lumber isn't typically sanded to the fineness of, say, a piece of fine furniture, but it is roughly finished. This makes it easier for construction workers to handle it, and it aids in constructability. For example, if the surface of a piece of lumber is undressed and has an extremely rough, jagged surface, it can cause a few problems. For example, when pulling a, a piece of lumber out of a pile, if it has a very rough, just exceedingly rough, unfinished surface, it might have a tendency to get snagged or caught on other pieces of material. Um, if lumber is dressed on all sides, it's easier to grab a 2x4 from a pile from a pile of 2x4s without it snagging. Another benefit is that it does reduce splinters. These, of course, can still happen and will happen um, whenever you're using lumber, but the problem is greatly reduced. Um, if you have a, uh, a piece of seasoned lumber, you might, or a piece of dressed lumber, I should say, uh, you might get a small quarter-inch long uh, sliver digging into your thumb, but you don't have to worry about a massive splinter embedding itself two inches into your hand. Finally, dressed lumber may aid a little bit in durability. A dressed piece of lumber will innately have less surface area than a roughly sized one, and many decay processes such as rot are affected by surface area. Now, of course, dressing won't magically uh, make uh, wood immune to rot, but it will increase its resiliency at least a little bit. Now, let's connect this back to nominal versus actual dimensions. A 2x4 might, might be exactly 2 inches by 4 inches after it's sawn, but dressing lumber inevitably reduces its dimensions slightly. We can see this in this graphic, the difference between nominal and actual sizes uh, for three types of sawn lumber. The types here are discussed. Uh, the types here discussed are rough sawn, uh, dressed, and full sawn, or dressed, rough sawn, and full sawn. Uh, dressed lumber refers, uh, or dressed lumber is lumber that has been both seasoned and dressed. It lost some area from both seasoning-related shrinkage and from the drying process, so it loses some area due to the shrinkage or due to the seasoning, 
that comes or the shrinkage that comes with seasoning and it loses some area due to the sanding or planing in the uh, dressing process. And as you can see here in the dressed lumber case, the nominal versus actual dimensions are quite different. Also, another term to be aware of, uh, you'll also hear the term S4S, and that refers to uh, lumber that has been sanded slash dressed on all four sides. Um, the next type of lumber that you might encounter or that you can see in this image is rough sawn. This is lumber that has been seasoned but not dressed. So it has been seasoned but it has not been dressed. Um, so it's lost a little area due to drying related shrinkage, which is a slight effect, uh, at least compared to sanding slash planing, slash planing, but it hasn't lost area due to sanding slash dressing. Thus, the difference between the nominal and actual dimensions is much lower for rough sawn than for dressed lumber. Finally, so we've covered dressed lumber and sawn lumber, and finally we have full sawn lumber. Um, this is lumber that aims to hit the nominal dimensions exactly. Uh, again, normally you saw lumber first and then you season it. With full sawn lumber, you do the opposite and season it before sawing it. You might, for example, you might air dry an entire tree trunk and then saw it once it's done seasoning. So you essentially let it, uh, you season it uh, as a whole tree trunk, let it go through all of its shrinkage process as it's drying out, and then you saw it afterwards. Um, and then in terms of dressing, you either don't dress it or you dress it, uh, you dress it such that the final dimensions are equal to the nominal dimensions of a piece of lumber you're aiming for. In other words, a full sawn 2x4 will have exact dimensions, exact exterior dimensions of 2 inches by 4 inches to within a very small margin of error. Um, with full sawn lumber, whatever kind of uh, dressing and seasoning processes you're applying, you calibrate them in such a manner that you will even after all those processes are done, you will end up with exactly your nominal dimensions, whether that's two inches by four inches, two by six inches, whatever it might be. Um, just note, uh, one thing to note is that full sawn lumber typically isn't available. And that's for a few reasons. First, the thicker a piece of wood is, the longer it will take to season. If you take, uh, if you try to dry a one foot diameter tree trunk before sawing, uh, you are going to have to literally store it for years before it dries out. Um, if instead you cut it down, then season it, the thinner pieces of lumber will dry through much, much quicker. And it's not necessarily even a linear process, it may be a exponential or a polynomial type process. So the thicker your piece of lumber, the, it's, it's an exponential type process. The, a, uh, if, you have a, if you're trying to dry out a, or evenly dry a you know, one foot thick piece of lumber, that is literally going to take you years. Um, second, if you want to dress full sawn lumber, uh, you would have to carefully dress it again so that, the, that its final dimensions match its nominal dimensions. Uh, it's nominal label dimensions. In other words, if you're if you want to have a, a final dress two by four that is exactly two inches by four inches, you have to make sure that all of your sanding processes and planing processes are exactly tuned in to just precisely hit that. So um, again, uh, if you want to if if you want to dress full sawn lumber, you have to carefully dress it so its final dimensions uh, exactly match its your whatever nominal dimensions you're aiming for. These both make both of these factors, the seasoning time and the precision required in, in uh, dressing, make full sawn lumber extremely expensive. Now, uh, full sawn lumber is used in some applications. Uh, you know, I always use the example of fine woodworking, um, but it's not something you'll typically find in construction grade lumber or you'll typically find in a, in a lumber yard. Uh, rough sawn doesn't even tend to be used much for construction. It's just uh, generally, uh, S4S is going to be your most practical, uh, or dress lumber is going to be your most practical, uh, cheapest, uh, you know, dimension grade or uh, construction grade lumber. So most of the time, that's what you encounter. Rough sawn lumber, you tend to see it uh, more in woodworking applications, although you do sometimes see it in construction, though rarely. And full sawn is something you almost have to custom order from a sawmill. Again, rather what you usually encounter is S4S fully dressed lumber. Because you cut the lumber before drying it, lumber seasons quickly and thus cheaply. Um, 
the drying time is that you, the time that you need to dry a piece of lumber is going to have direct implications for the cost of it. You have, if you want to dry lumber, um, you either need to dry it in a building or in a kiln. Uh, if you're drying it in a building, like a uh, like a barn or something, you'll or just any kind of uh, if you're gonna air dry it, you need to keep the rain off it. And if you need to uh, kiln dry it, you obviously need to stick it in a kiln. And uh, the longer that's going to take, the bigger your kiln needs to be, the bigger your drying building needs to be, whatever. And and the longer you have to sit on it before you can then go and sell it. So drying time relates directly to cost. Um, also with Espress, the exact dimensions don't have to hit an exact precise value to two or three decimal points. Wood, again, as a biological material, uh, has a lot of variability. We talked about this at the beginning of the course, and I want to bring this, I'm going to bring this back up again and again. Um, wood is fundamentally different than materials like steel and concrete in that it is a biological material. And because of that, it has a lot of innate variability. So it's very difficult to dress a piece of lumber to say within a thousandth of an inch. Rather, we saw lumber than use reduced dimensions in our calculations. Since there is some variability, the exact dimensions cannot be known with, without individually measuring each cross section. Instead, we assume certain reduced dimensions and then require lumber manufacturers to be within a certain margin of error of that in their final seasoned dressed products. For example, a 2x4 has nominal dimensions of 2 inches by 4 inches. Its standard dressed size is 1.5 inch by 3.5 inch. In design, we will assume that all 2x4s have these dimensions after being uh, uh, seasoned and dressed. There may be some uh, above and below that value, but the assumed dimensions are adequate for design. The material strengths provided in the uh, NDS and its supplements uh, have enough factor of safety in them to compensate for uh, slight variability in, se in section size, in cross-sectional dimensions. In short, we label sawn members according to their nominal size, and then we assume a certain standard dress size. This standard dress size is used in the calculation of all section properties. So uh, let's go back to the 2x4 example. So we have a 2x4, and let's say we have a 2x4. And as a review, what this refers to is at the time of sawing, at the time of sawing, this thing would have a thickness of right about two inches and a width of right about four inches. But after it has been dressed and seasoned, its dimensions will be reduced slightly. And, uh, if you go out to a lumber yard and go to a big pile of two by fours, all of which that have been dressed and seasoned, you will inevitably, and you measured them very precisely with a set of calipers or something, you would inevitably find that there is a certain amount of variability. However, they'd probably all be within a 16th or probably even a 32nd um, of their standard reduced dimensions. And the standard reduced dimensions of a two by four are 3.5 inches by 1.5 inches. So again, um, this is after, um, let's say after dressing and seasoning. So after it's fully dried out, after we have uh, sanded it to the, as far as we're gonna go, its final actual dimensions will be close to 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches. Now, again, they won't be exactly that, probably within a 16th or a 32nd, but again, there's enough factor of safety in our assumed stresses or our assumed uh, allowable stresses to uh, compensate for this. So um, now then let's also look at how this is used to calculate section properties. So again, as I mentioned, the uh, these uh, assumed standard reduced dimensions are what will be used when calculating section properties. So we do not use, in, when calculating our section properties, we're not gonna use this two inch and four inch. Instead, what we're gonna use is this 1.5 inch by 3.5 inches. So if I'm doing, say, a tension problem and I need to know the uh, cross-sectional area of a two by four, I will say that's 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches. And I'll go ahead and plug that into my calculator, 1.5 by 
and I get 5.25 inches. Oh, sorry, not 5.25 inches, 5.25 inches squared. Got to make sure we get our units right. 5.25 inches squared. Uh, then, for ex what if I wanted the uh, moment of inertia? If I wanted the inertia, moment of inertia, let's say about its strong axis, well, the formula for that would be bh cubed over 12. Um, let's say bh cubed over 12. And, uh, again, I'm going to use my... Now, no, I'm, I'm calculating this about its strong axis, so uh, using this as the b and this as the h. And that would be 1.5 inches uh, times 3.5 inches to the third power and then divided by 12. I'll go ahead and throw that into my calculator. So 1.5 times 3.5 to the third, all of that over 12, and I get a moment of inertia about the strong axis of uh, 5.4, or actually I'll go ahead and put a little more decimal on that, a few more decimal places, 5.36. And of course, because moment of inertia, our units will be inches to the fourth power. Now let's go ahead and compare this to table 1b in the NDS supplement. So uh, I'm going to go here to the 2x4, and uh, again, if you're not familiar, uh, this would be another good table to tab in your uh, supplement if you have a paper edition. Uh, these are your standard uh, dimensions and section properties for uh, your standard sum, your standard S4S SOM lumber sizes. So uh, we looked at a 2x4, and again, we said it's standard dressed size, it's standard reduced dimensions, are 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches. And we calculated that we had a cross-sectional area of 5.25 square inches, which is exactly what the uh, NDS here has. And then we also calculated a moment of inertia about the strong axis of 5.36 inches to the fourth power. So we can see that the uh, math in this table does work out, at least as far as it comes to two by fours. Now, um, something else I should point out. So, uh, when I calculated that 2x4's cross-sectional area, I used the formula A is equal to pH, and when I calculated strong axis moment of inertia, what a terribly drawn rectangle, I used the formula I equals BH cubed over 12. Now, um, if you're familiar, if you remember, or if you remember back to your statics, your statics or your mechanics, uh, you'll recall that these formulas are perfectly valid and perfectly fine. However, uh, they apply to rectangles, and that's fine. But but the care, the key thing is that they apply to perfect rectangles. Now, let's uh, let's see if I can draw a rectangle. I can manage to not screw that up too badly. So. Now here is the conundrum. If you've ever actually, uh, if you've ever actually gone to a big box store or a lumber yard or you know Home Depot, whatever it might be, if you've ever actually gone to one of those stores and picked up a two by four, um, you might you know be sitting there going, wait a minute, wait a minute, how can I, how can I assume that that's okay? Uh, how can that formula be valid? Because if you've ever handled a two by four, or a lot of construction, you know, construction lumber you'll note that they tend to have rounded corners. You don't tend to find construction lumber with perfectly uh, right angled, uh, with perfect right angled uh, corners, simply because those, uh, well, it's one of those handleability things, constructability things. And also it makes the, the finish easier. It makes the finishing process easier if the corners are rounded. And uh, if you've had a perfectly squ uh, square corners, uh, if you maintain that through the finishing process, and you, when you actually start working with these, uh, they'd end up getting all banged up and bruised and uh, dented and things like that. And there's really no point to having these uh, perfectly crisp, clear, um, these perfectly crisp, clear uh, 90 degree angles on the edges of two by fours. Well, uh, for one, because they're probably gonna end up behind drywall anyway, and two, um, they're gonna get, they'd get all banged up during the construction process anyway. So, um, for both constructability and for uh, just 
um, durability and for finishing, we end up uh, for the for the dressing process, I should say, we uh, t uh, manufacturers typically uh, round over the corners on um, uh, dimensional lumber. However, there is one problem. Remember back to the formulas we used. Uh, we have something here that has rounded over corners, but we're using the formula for a perfect exact rectangle. Again, this is what we assumed in black here. And in green is what we actually have. Huh. That's interesting. So, uh, if you, now if you remember back to your mechanics, there is no reason we couldn't actually go and calculate this. You know, calculate its exact area, calculate its, uh, calculate its exact moment of inertia, etc. You know, we could divide this up into a series of, say we could divide this into a, you know, a quarter circle and then a rectangle and another rectangle, a series of quarter circles, you know, apply the parallel axis theorem. And we could absolutely calculate the, uh, precise moment of inertia if we knew the, the radius of that curvature or the uh, radius of curvature of that corner. However, if you actually look at the, um, if you, you know, look at a two by four, I've exaggerated the uh, effect of this rounding. You're typically looking at, you know, an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, etc. And so the way the NDS handles this and the way we're going to handle this in wood design is that you're going to see that, that, that because of the variability in wood, there is a relatively large factor of safety in a lot of our assumptions and design processes, and this is one of them. So here is how we're going to address the, the, the conundrum between rectangular and a perfect rectangles and rounded edges. What we're going to do is the technic and the, and the, we're going to take the amazingly precise technical method of saying close enough. In other words, yes, calculating the cross-sectional area using, uh, calculating the cross-sectional area and the moment of inertia uh, assuming rounded corners would be slightly more precise um, than, uh, you know, assuming a rectangle. But beca again, because of just how variable wood is as a material, we end up having to use a relatively large factor of safety in our design assumptions anyway. And so, um, it ultimately just doesn't matter. If you were to go and calculate the difference between these, they would amount to a very small, a slight difference in the area and the other section properties. So um, when, when I go through design calculations, I'm going to assume dimensional lumber, for example, is a perfect rectangle, and I'm going to ignore any kind of round over effects on edges, that sort of thing. And since we went and checked the uh, values assumed in the NDS's own table, we can see that this is the exact process used by design codes as well, or design specifications as well. Um, the NDS, even though in almost every con uh, construction 2x4 you'll encounter, uh, even though almost every construction 2x4 you encounter will have rounded over edges, the uh, rounded over corners, the NDS does assume that they are in fact perfect rectangles. And yes, this is a slight inaccuracy, but as we'll see in most things with lumber and wood construction, there's a lot of, there's a bit of a fudge factor here. So um, if you actually look at the uh, stress values, for example, those are usually highly conservative. They have to be in order to take into account the natural variability of wood. And on the one hand, that does make uh, for uh, buildings that are highly redundant, but on the other hand, it does uh, allow us to make a few design shortcuts like this one. Now, um, the design code always says, or the design specifications like the NDS, um, they are always minimums. So if you want to go and uh, go deeper, basically they say, you have to design to this level of specificity. If you want to go and do a deeper analysis, you always can go beyond what the code requires. Um, so if you are so determined and you're an engineer and you're really, you're really a stickler for precision, if you really want to calculate all your cross, your section property, your cross-sectional properties using rounded over edges or rounded over corners, you can, and that's perfectly fine in terms of the specification, but uh, that's going to take a lot more time, a lot more effort, and ultimately it's not going to make much difference in terms of the uh, actual um, amount of material used in a building.
Finally, I want to discuss classification of Psalm Lumber products. So we're zooming in uh, and we're zooming in from the broader category of lumber products. So we're ignoring any kind of engineered wood products and looking specifically at sawn lumber products. And then within sawn lumber products, um, the NDS classifies them according to a few uh, categories. And then there are certain provisions that apply to certain categories, but not others. Thus, it's important to be aware of how various sawn elements are classified. So boards are classified as any sawn lumber with a nominal narrowest dimension of one inch or less. Dimensional lumber is any lumber with a nominal narrowest dimension of at least two inches and no more than four inches. Um, posts and timbers are any lumber with a nominal narrowest dimension of more than four inches and whose width and height differ by no more than two inches. Uh, and then beams and stringers are any lumber with, uh, like again, any sawn lumber, with a nominal narrowest dimension of more than four inches and whose width and height differ by more than two inches. So what does this all, all this gobbledygook actually mean? Well, um, boards, again, are going to be what you expect. They're very, you know, very thin elements. Uh, they have very narrow uh, thickness. You might typically have something, you know, with a nominal dimension of one inch, um, an actual dimension of like three quarter inch. And then it could be, you know, have nominal uh, width of, say, I don't know, four inches, six inches, eight inches, 12 inches, whatever it might be. So um, they tend to be much, uh, boards by their nature are going to be wide, flat elements. And again, the reason I'm going over this is that there are certain provisions in the NDS that apply to certain types of sawn lumber products and not others. So it is important to be aware of um, how different sawn lumber products are classified. Then dimensional lumber. Um, so again, this, these are all basically going to be one buys. Uh, again, they're all going to be just basically be one buys. I suppose you could have a one half buy, but you typically don't actually see uh, dimensional lumber or sorry, uh, sawn lumber labeled like that. Typically, if you see a board in a construction setting, it's typically going to be a one buy. Then if you have dimensional lumber, uh, dimensional lumber is actually what we use most often in um, wood construction, or at least in terms of um, light frame wood construction. And these are going to be your, uh, so again, this is your um, boards. And then in dimensional lumber, these are gonna be your two buys and your four buys. So things like two by fours, two by sixes, two by eight, etc. And of course, four by, uh, four by fours, uh, four by six, etc. So if you start getting any bigger than that, though, or in other words, if any of your, if any, if your narrowest dimension exceeds four inches, if your uh, narrowest nominal dimension exceeds four inches, then you go to these two. So these are kind of the big guys. Um, again, their narrowest dimension. Is greater than four inches. Um, and then within that, you have your beams, well, um, beams and stringers, and then your posts and timbers. Or another way to think of this is beams versus posts. And uh, let me go forward and I can draw a little bit here. So what is the difference between these and how are they classified? Um, well, generally, again, we, we mentioned, let's go back to here. Beams and stringers are any lumber with a nominal narrowest dimension more than four inches. Well, that same thing applies to both beams and stringers and posts and, and timbers. Um, so we're talking about chunky members here. We're talking about chunky wood here. Big pieces of sawn lumber. You know, something you'd see in a, I don't know, if, if you can imagine seeing it in some sort of a great hall in Game of Thrones, then you might be dealing with, you're probably not dealing with dimensional lumber. Um, <laughs> And then, um, but to classify between these two categories, we have to look very carefully at the language, whose width and height differ by no more than two inches and more than two inches. So if the, the height and width can differ by up to two inches and it will still be a, 
a post and timber, but any more than that, and it will be a beam or a stringer. Although, well, beams and stringers are in terms of, are two different things in terms of construction, but in terms of labeled sections, uh, if we're classifying a piece of lumber, we, we classify them as the category beams and stringers, um, regardless whether it's gonna actually be used as a beam or a stringer. And I wanna explain why. So, again, let's look at posts and timbers. and beams and stringers. So if I do uh, the width minus the, the difference between the width and the uh, height, or if I were gonna, if I would label a cross section, say H and B, I would say that H minus B is less than or equal to two inches. While here, H minus B is greater than or equal, not actually, I'm not, got to be very careful with this. Not greater than or equal to, just greater than. Greater than two inches. Um, so, let's think about this. So let's say you have some, oh, also, we have to remember that our narrowest dimension has to be greater than four inches. And of course, all of these are nominal sizes, uh, not uh, actual sizes. So let's say you have a six by six. What would that be? Well, again, that would mean a uh, a piece of sawn lumber a, that has um, a, a narrowest dimension. Well, sorry, that has nominal dimensions of six inches by six inches. So those are our nominal dimensions, and we know it definitely falls into one of these categories or the other because it does have a narrowest dimension greater than four inches. Our nominous narrow dimension. Uh, sorry, nominal. Uh, narrowest nominal dimension greater than four inches. And if I look at the uh, difference in the dimensions, well, H minus B, that's zero, it's less than or equal to two inches, so it is indeed a post and timber. What about something, oh, let's say like a, oh, let's do like a six by 10. So a six by 10, well, let's see, there are two, again, there are two classifications or two criteria to be classified as a beam slash a stringer. One, the narrowest dimension. The narrowest dimension has to be greater than four inches. And in this case, the narrowest dimension, the narrowest nominal dimension is six inches. So it will, uh, it meets that, it meets that checkbox. Um, then H minus B, is going to be 10 minus six equals four inches. And this of course is greater than two inches. So it does meet the classification. Again, uh, if we take the nominal dimensions and subtract the uh, height from the width, and if it's uh, less than or equal to two inches, it's going to be a post and timber. If it's greater than two inches, it's going to be a beam and a stringer. And this is again for uh, any piece of sawn lumber with uh, uh, a narrowest dimension greater than four inches. Not greater than or equal to four inches, but just greater than four inches. So I know this can be very confusing and it's, uh, it's a wonderful game sometimes you have to play to remember the exact precise rules of how uh, each of these is defined, but it can be important. So I would suggest practicing with a few of these. Now, one important thing to keep in mind, why do we separate these out? Why do we have two different categories of posts and timbers and beams and stringers? Well. The reason we separate them into two categories, this and this, into post and timbers, beams and stringers, and then dimensional lumber, for example, is that dimensional lumber, again, is what you tend to see most common in construction because it is sort of your, um, uh, you know, uh, dirt cheap, uh, well, not necessarily dirt cheap, definitely not as cheap as actual dirt, but um, which we do sometimes use, or I should say soil in civil engineering contexts. Um, but it is sort of your, uh, mass-produced, uh, maximum affordability type of lumber. You're going for economy, and you, because of that, you need to have thinner members to make the drawing process quicker. And so um, dimensional lumber especially is what you'll typically see in construction. And then posts and timbers are separated out because by the time you start getting over four inches in your narrowest dimension, uh, you start leaving the types of sizes that dimensional lumber manufacturers really can mass-produce cheaply and so uh, that becomes its own category. 
But then why do we separate out these two categories? Well, let's think about two different shapes. So if the height and the width can differ by no more than two inches, what this means is that you're going to end up with a cross section that is approximately square. It may be, you know, slightly rectangular, if, you know, in the case of say like a, you know, a, a six by eight or something like that. Yes, with a six by eight, you might have, you'll of course have a slightly rectangular cross section, but um, if slightly rectangular, it's still going to be primarily square. These are posts and timbers can be thought of as um, approximately square uh, members within a certain amount of deviation. But then if you have beams and stringers, they're going to have a, uh, a height and a width by, that differ by quite, a, quite an amount. Something more like this. Now, um, that doesn't have a lot of use um, per se, but what if you take that shape and then put it right side up? So let's think about these two different shapes. What are these good for? Well, if you remember, just think back to basic mechanics. All of this at the end of the day can come, can, will always come back to basic mechanics and structures and statics. This is going to be really good for a beam. And that's, it's no surprise, it no, should be no surprise that this can be labeled as a beam. Meanwhile, a, and of course the reason for that is that this shape maximizes uh, your moment of inertia which is related to your bending resistance. So uh, a, a long, tall shape, or longer, tall shape, in, or longer, tall rectangle is going to be, uh, is going to be, uh, have its cross section optimized for bending. Meanwhile, something like this, if you think back to like mechanics and look at the equations for column design, for example, um, the, uh, the, for example, the Euler buckling strength is, or the elastic buckling strength of a column is not just related to the moment of inertia, it's related to the I min. So if you have a column that's being governed by, if you have a slender column that's governed by um, elastic buckling criteria, whichever axis, your X or Y axis, your X or Y bending axis, whichever one of those is smaller, that is the one that's going to control your um your uh, uh that's what that, that's the one that's going to give you your minimum moment of inertia and thus control your um uh axial capacity in terms of buckling so again while a beam while a uh, taller section will maximize bending capacity if you want to maximize axial capacity compression capacity um, you just want to make sure you maximize your minimum moment of inertia. In other words, you want a column, I mean, something like this here would be a very poor column because yes, you have lots of capacity about the, uh, about the X axis, but you have very little capacity about the Y axis and that works fine, just fine for bending. But when you get to buckling, that's a phenomenon that can happen about either axis suddenly that's not going to work. So if you want to have, a, if you're designing a column, if you're choosing a section for a column, um, the ideal would actually be a circle, but in terms of rectangles, you want to get that as square as possible. So the optimal beam will be a long skinny uh, cross section and the optimal column will be a big square cross section. And that is why we separate these out into two categories, because ultimately they experience different types of loads or they're used differently, they experience different types of loads. And there are certain provisions within the NDS that apply to each of them. And with that, I think we'll wrap up for today. Again, this video is just intended to illustrate some types of lumber products and how some uh, how sawn lumber products are classified. In the next lecture, we'll be learning about moisture content in lumber and the overall seasoning process. If you found this uh, video informative, please like, comment, and subscribe to make the YouTube robots happy. Uh, if you'd like to help uh, make content like this possible, see the link to our Patreon page in the video description. Regardless, I look forward to seeing you again in the next lecture. I'll see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.